The topic uh, that we have to discuss now is, in some sense, the mother of all subjects. It's about the macroeconomic situation. And uh, to help us uh, navigate through this conversation, I have uh, with me people from multiple functions or multiple industries and multiple parts of the world. On my extreme right, I have uh, Mr. Extreme left, rather, I have Mr. Marin Guttard, who serves as the Group Chief Audit Executive and Senior Executive Vice President of Banco Santander. And uh, he is also served as the Vice President of the Santander Asset Management Company, he has extensive risk and audit experience. And uh, so, certainly look forward to hearing his views. On uh, my immediate left, I have Mr. Muchen, who is the Editorial Director of the Economist Global Business Review, which is based in Shanghai. Before that, he was the head of the editorial Asia Pacific of Europe Finance, part of the Economist Group, and also editor of CFO China, also an Economist uh, Group publication. And during his career, career in journalism, he worked for Business Week in Hong Kong, Bloomberg News in Singapore, and the International News Department of Singapore News Agency in Beijing. Thank you uh, for joining us. Certainly, China is a big part of the macroeconomic story, and it'll be interesting to hear Mr. Wuchin's comment. On my right, I have Mr. Dua, Mr. Dilip Dua, who's been an entrepreneur, a regular, I understand, at Horizon. Uh, so he's uh, uh, not only, uh, you know, has his own views, but he's heard views, I'm sure, over the years, and, and so he'd like to contribute and certainly give the India perspective as well. You know, the macroeconomic situation we discussed uh, yesterday as well <coughs> is going through a very interesting phase. If you look at it, at a fundamental level, inflation is low. Central banks have the opportunity to cut uh, interest rates if they need to. Uh, most parts of the world, from a macroeconomic point of view, Latin America is turning around. The U.S. has been doing quite well. While there's a lot of concern about China, it's still growing at 6.5%, which is fantastic for a $12 trillion uh, economy. Uh, Southeast Asian region, South Asia itself, uh, you know, we talk about India, but even a country like Bangladesh has been doing very well over the last few years. Africa is the next great opportunity. More than 3 billion people are going to be added there over the next 50, 60 years. So to me, if you look at it at a very fundamental level, uh, a lot seems to be going for the macroeconomic environment. But when you get to the next level, if you look at the geopolitical risk, if you look at the trade issues, and if you look at even the continent that we are in, in Europe, <coughs> there is aging, the demographics are going against uh, increasing spending consumption. And so there are many uh, long-term trends which also we need to be watchful of, plus whatever are the actions which uh, are translating into the weakening of the multilateral system. So it's a very interesting phase, and I think uh, this is certainly going to be a very uh, interesting year to see how things play out. We also have elections <coughs> in the U.S. Uh, coming up next year, and I'm sure uh, that will have its own set of uh, complexities which it brings to the table. So uh, I will request each of my fellow panelists to uh, share their thoughts for a few minutes, uh, maybe five minutes each, and then after that, we open the floor for questions because this is a subject I'm sure everyone has a view, everyone has an opinion, and uh, the idea is to make it interactive so that we get all thoughts on the table. So I will start with this question. Yeah. Thank you very much, for asking for the video here. And we are going to be talking about the outlook of the world economy for 45 minutes, which seems to be quite a task. More if we have to get to some reasonable conclusions. Well, uh, it seems for me quite clear that uh, in the past, the role of the economists, the professional ones and the amateur ones, were more or less to predict the future, and they were not always right. But nowadays, it seems that they are even struggling to explain the past, not even to predict the future. But having said this, and if we have to talk about the outlook, in my view, if we think about some years from now, the outlook would be clearly very positive, as it has been in the past. And the data of the International uh, the World Bank, for example, in the past years, from 1990, each day, 100,000 people have been out of poverty. So that's an amazing number. And I think that the future, looking at this six, three, four, five years from now, will be the same. Not only because at the end of the day, capitalism adapts uh, to the new requirements, but also because uh, the globalization overall has been quite positive. Having said that, it's also 
quite clear that the, the path and the consequences of that evolution of different regions would be quite different. And probably Europe will be one of the extremes and Asia may be one of the others. If we talk not about that medium term uh, outcome, but the most close one, one, two years, well, it seems that we are in a kind of a slowdown since maybe uh, mid 2018 in different situations in different countries and regions, as you have mentioned. And I guess that we have to accept that in the next future, something like a recession, probably not a recession, but a deeper slowdown, can be expected. And the hope of us, I guess, is that politicians, and I guess we will be talking on that later on, will be clear enough uh, not to damage, but to help some of it. So, very boldly speaking, that will be my first Thank you, thank you, Mr. Martin. I think it's important uh, that a lot of people have moved out of poverty, but the reality is that uh, what we discussed yesterday also, a lot of people also believe that the system is loaded in favor of the people at the top. So we discussed that, and I think inclusion and uh, inequality are issues which uh, are coming up and manifesting itself into electoral outcomes across uh, the world. I'll move to uh, Mr. Wuchin. Uh, I think uh, he's got extensive experience uh, looking at China on behalf of the economist and uh, certainly the power to use. I think I'd, I'd like to maybe just get two points on the macroeconomic history of China and also the challenges and opportunities China is facing. So we look at uh, the, you know, I think 2019 marks a very important year because I think this week also will probably be an interesting week to follow because possibly President Xi and uh, President Trump will be able to meet on the sideline of Osaka G20 meeting and I think between China and the U.S. come to, to terms and reach a ceasefire of the civil war, I think everyone will be a little bit relieved. But I think if you look at the U.S. politics, the clash between China and the United States may be a a long-lasting one, and because if you look at uh, you know, history for for, for reference, you know, the U.S. and Japan had a clash, U.S. and Soviet Union had uh, the Cold War, and China, to a large extent, is like the combination of Japan and Soviet Union uh, together, but with definitely very different characteristics. We had a specific statistic saying that you know, if you look at the the, the, the key of the Cold War, U.S. Uh, Soviet Union trade every year is only two billion. China trade with U.S. every day for two billion dollars. So that's the implication. I think China and the United States ten years ago we coined the word for America. Right? So it's joint at the hip. The big question is whether really the two economies can be coupled because we're not talking about not only talking about technology. Transfer, uh, supply chain integration, and the trade, and also, you know, so many people, business people as well as students uh, coming to each other countries. It's very, very hard to decouple. So that would give us a lot of confidence that the two countries may be able to stick together. But given that the, the unpredictability of Trump and also the fascination or expectation on getting elected or re elected uh, uh, next year, he may want to prolong the trade war so that he will be, uh, be shown as tough. So I think there are tactical calculations that we need to do with the consideration, but there are strategic shifts because when we talk to uh, especially the two makers in DC, I think there's a general consensus that uh, the United States are not uh, disappointed by China, especially in the past. And uh, or past five years, because China is not uh, transforming in a way that the U.S. has anticipated, given the economic development as well as the kind of engagement that the West has uh, trying to work with China. And within China, I think there's also uh, a kind of urge among the more reform-minded uh, bureaucrats and policymakers is that you know they, they wanted to see some, some kind of pressure from. Uh, overseas to actually help China transform. Because China, Chinese economy has also come to a very interesting and important uh, crossroads. So 
the, the, the fact that China has achieved steady years of rapid economic growth is itself a great achievement, but many of the people in China have realized that the experience, the learning, the know-how they've gained in the past 30 years may not be applicable for China's future growth. Because, you know, when you try to catch up with the West, it's easy. You are working in a fine environment where you get instant feedback, you know the past, and you know uh, the, the pros and cons of various different policies. And now you are entering into a space where China wanted to be, or has to be, a leader in many different fronts. I mean, you need to be a leader in technology innovation, you need to be a leader in a, a responsible leader in global affairs, you need to be a leader in driving globalization. And there are a lot of unknown, known unknowns that we have to deal with, and it requires a different mindset requires more openness. And that's something the Chinese policymakers, I think, especially the four minded ones, would hope the trade war would help China come through the period and then uh, embark on a new path for reform and openness rather than retreat to a more like, closed economy. So that's just number two. And number three, I just want to highlight some of the structural change, uh, challenges that China is facing. I was amazed uh, when I was listening to the panels uh, yesterday that some of the challenges in the Americas is the same, similar challenges in China has, but on a different scale. But China needs to deliver jobs, high quality jobs for people, because we are graduating 8 million college graduates every year. So can you deliver that kind of job? And China also has experienced rapid urbanization, but with high rises of housing prices in the major cities, can you actually uh, help? the young generation find a good job that could uh, afford a, a you know, reasonable life in, in the cities. That's another challenge. China has this huge debt burden. The, uh, the banking sector in China, the finance, financial sector in China is definitely needs change. Uh, so that's number three. And of course, China has a problem of how do you balance sales and prices and the private entrepreneurship. Because we need, we know that the private sector is employing 80 percent of the uh, 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 jobs, but the government seems to still favor state sector. So these are the challenges that China needs to address. So I would argue that you know the trade war itself wouldn't hurt China or the United States because the export only accounts for a small uh, fraction of China's growth. But it's really the kind of structural changes that China needs to. Uh, to, and China needs a more uh, a, a kind of a, a, a good international environment to push to that kind of change. Otherwise, you know, we may end up in a lose lose situation, lose meaning that you know China is looking inward, the United States is looking inward, globalization is put on a hold, and of course, as we said earlier, when two elephants fight with each other, there's a lot of there's, there's going to be a lot of collateral damage to the global economy, and that's something we want, definitely want to do uh, uh, today. So, I think uh, that's what the rest of the world is concerned about. I think China and the U.S. get into a, a you know, a kind of wrestling match and yeah. the rest of the guys in the room get uh, hurt. So, uh, but I think you said a very interesting thing and I heard this from one of the senior politicians in India as well, that the political alignment and the trade alignment could be different, yeah. you know. And uh, your own magazine carried an article on a cover saying that an ISA is not trade. Yeah. So it's kind of uh, it's an interesting thing. You also said that the way China grows in the future could be different from the way it has grown in the past. And I think I, it's a good way for me to come into uh, Mr. Dilip Gua because to me, one of the opportunities for India, apart from the opportunities that we keep talking about of uh, young demographic and growing uh, economy, etc., is that we can learn from the experience of, of the others, including China and the rest of the world. So, obviously, the way we grow need not be the same way that others have grown. We can learn from the experiences and have a more, I would say, a resource efficient clean and cleaner growth. But uh, I look forward to hearing your views. Namaste. The opportunity given by the Horasis and the meetings attended in the last couple of years, it's given me a different horizon to the world. And I'm very happy to be here in Segovia, greetings for the Segovia Day. And I really appreciate the hospitality and the warmth extended by IE University. It's my pleasure to be 
for the panel and uh, thank you Narendra and uh, thank you Frank. The topic what we are saying is economy and the outward economy. Is it the government driving the economy or the economy is driven by the entrepreneurs? That's a very big key to the whole story. And when we look at the facts, there is criticism when we call it trumpetism, when we call it Brexit, when we call it the other aspects of the story. But when we look at global migration, global growth, and global recession, there's one thing which is common. It's global. That means today, nothing is independent. We have to ask the question whether our country is independent or it's every moment globally what is being discussed is being deliberated, is happening, is impacting the different countries. That's a big challenge. The policy is what we are looking at the guarding as an entrepreneur, what I feel in my opinion, is story of aspirations, which has been talked by His Excellency Mr. Varma yesterday. The story of aspirations is there. But is that story of aspirations meeting the IMF story of growth of 3.3 growth story and saying that 2019 or the end of 2019 will see the 3.6. It, it's, a, it's a question, it's a jumble. But how do you get across that jumble? Yes, the solidarity of the politics and the decision making coming from the political seniors makes a lot of things happen. In India, we have voted and we have voted from mind and from the heart. In Hindi, I will say, Dil se or Dimag se humne voting kya. So populism and the voting and the right what you have for vote really makes a difference in the economy of a country. And the continuity of the policies is again a big driver into the system. So looking at the whole story of holistic growth story of the economy of India and coming back to the India and when we're saying that what are the questions what is posed for the accelerating growth of India. Yes, relationship with U.S., relationship with China, geopolitics with Russia, with the Security Council, see all those parameters what is being discussed globally for India, they are very important. Every aspect of relationship is important. A true truth, I mean, I was very happy to understand and listen a big word from the minister also, that the truth, truth and the faith, is important in the world today to drive the economy also. Are we really realistic or we are just going gaga? The relationship of India and US needs to be improvised. I have a friend here who's from US and uh, His Excellency Williams. We, I must say, the way these two gentlemen are looking at the improvement in the US strategy of India, I think India has to also look beyond China or beyond Russia the relationship improvement in American story, whether it is Mr. Trump or next president, whoever is coming to the vote, that will be a biggest driver. But coming back to the India story, how does the India get into the exploration? The first thing what is important in India's exploration story is, is the good governance. Yes, today we have a good governance. We have proven track record, we have delivered, and we are improving. Then the second thing what the world is looking at today is not GDP. I think GDP has become a question mark after attending a workshop which was there uh, yesterday. It's the cross national happiness. A country like Bhutan, they don't look at GDP, they look at cross national happiness. Are we really good economists or are we happy inside or are we good businessmen? That's also important. Then for the India, the financial aspect of putting the infrastructure in place. Yes, it's very critical. It's an economic driver. It's a sustainable development is the only answer in the country today. And inclusive growth, that will only come from finance. In the world, nothing moves with finance. And the financial capital will only move where there is surety, returns, security, and policy continuity. Yes, India is there, and we are bound to be there. But, yes, we need to improve on tax-free bonds. We should look at the models and we should get into the regime of tax-free bonds. Then yes, what we are looking at the export policy like China. China has done a lot of good things. 
and they are better off with the hydro development. They have done that and they followed the model of Canadians, Canadians powering the U.S. and the U.S. gets a green power always and finally India has gone for green power and the renewable power of hydro getting from 25 megawatts to number of megawatts, now it is all green, it's renewable. So thank God after the four years and six years of advocacy, the World Bank and the International Hydro Association which I represent also in the chair have really gone ahead and seen that the development of hydro will take place in India. The export trade balances is also one of the key of the key drivers of the economy. So export projects, and when I talk about export projects, I don't want to leave Spain behind. Spain is one of the most crucial points for, as a platform for Indian companies to go to Africa and Latin America. If you guys want to do good business, we should have at least one office in Spain to do business in Latin America or headquarters here. That is the key punchline and it gives us both economies a driving support from India as well as from Spain. And yes, what Mr. Pukas Nunda was talking, the next growth story comes from African continent. That will can happen from this place and that is Spain. And the fifth, which is the important aspect of Government of India, which is likely to be improvised and which is getting improvised, and that is public-private partnership is one of the biggest economic drivers in the world today. So if you're looking at an entrepreneurship skills, PPP is there. But is the PPP model fitting for every project is the same thing? No. It has got three dimensions, three dimensions which are important. I would say the three, three D. Every project has to be individual, but that project is at a doable cost, at a, a what it is delivering to the economy, and what it is, which team is dealing it. I would say every project is specific and dealing of the team is a crucial aspect. But in India, the turnaround and exposition will not happen overnight. There is no magic wand. We, we need to look at and that's a self-consumption model with sustainability bridge and sunrise will be there. We are looking at solar alliances, we are looking at the development and things are happening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I think uh, that's a uh, good comprehensive view of the different sectors and what possible and needed. I'd like to throw the uh, 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 session open for questions so that if there are any questions from the audience, yes, Thank you for all of your very spirited interventions on a huge subject. But I want to go back this morning to your remarks at the beginning on the global economic situation and ask you to focus on one aspect, and that is debt. We are facing over the last several years an unprecedented increase in global national consumer debt. Is this present debt profile sustainable? What are the risks involved in government, in corporations, and in households maintaining the level of debt that has been incurred in the years since 2007, 2008? So, clearly, that's a very relevant element if we talk about why about the economy. But having said that, and there are some numbers, not all have the same conclusion, the amount of debt, including public debt and private debt, worldwide today is even bigger than the one we had before 2008. But there are some uh, aspects that mitigate the problem that are at least the problem. First, the structure of the, let's say, architectural economic instrument to deal with problems is better today than we have in the past. And at least in the part that I know best, that is the bank, the structure of the capital of bank, the strength of the balance sheet of the bank, and the supervision of bank is much better today, both in terms of the deepness and the intensity of the supervision 
but also in terms of the governments of the banks themselves. At the same time, from a public debt point of view, there are places like Europe where, even though the size of the public debt is still quite relevant, and you have to differentiate between, between one country and other countries, globally speaking, for Europe as a whole, the situation of public debt is much better than the one we have in the past few years. Clearly. Even in Europe, one of the most relevant debates we are having is that if you consider Europe as an economic entity, well, quite a lot of people is asking today about using the budgetary policies. It means some countries, mainly Germany, have the real possibility of making additional investment, additional costs, because they have the budgetary possibility to do so. While others, like Spain or Greece, are not speaking that the case. So when you look at it from that point of view, in some cases, we have that possibility. The problem is governance, because we have not a governance for the EU. Even during the last few years, we have been discussing about the possibility of establishing a real budget for Europe as a whole, in which things like the Germans having the possibility of additional expenditure has been discussed. And so many times in Europe, we have not get back to final conclusion. And finally, just to make those three comments, it is also clear that in the present situation in which having said this mitigating fact, there is a death problem in the world, we may face two main additional risks. One is that even though as of today it is not the case, and we have seen the threat one week ago, and we have seen bragging one week ago, stating that they are not going to increase the interest rates, they are going to keep them or drop them. So the risk of interest increasing and affecting the amount of debt that has to pay, be paid back seemingly is not a given. And the other risk is that as far as the growth, generally speaking, particularly in some countries, is slowing down, if you slow down the growth, that affects the capacity of the government to pay back the debt. And for example, in Spain, we have reduced the ratio of debt against a GDP because we have had a good growth. But if that does not happen anymore, maybe a problem. So the combination of a slow growth and interest rate growing upward may be a big problem. Thank you. In fact, I'll give this additional question also to Mr. Chenu because uh, there's also a lot of uh, speculation on the debt situation in China, the shadow banking. Uh, debt to GDP is very different than it was in 2008 when China could spend its way out of trouble. So, what is your take on that? We've had extensive coverage on the debt problem. Of course, technically, the uh, debt stage is over 300% in China, which is by any standard is very high. And of course, the debt is concentrated on the state sector. The state owned enterprises are you know, piling up huge debt because they feel like you know, banks still stay lending to their savings. And so there's a structural dysfunction of the Chinese banking system. And that also produces room for shadow banking, be it in the think tank, be it in the peer to peer lending, be it in a system kind of financial scheme. So, so the government is cracking down on this uh, P2P because they have a concern that these pile up of uh, private enterprises there and consumption debt because these people are not being well served by the state owned banking system, they tend to be alternative and they are, you know, they have to pay much higher interest rates to get finance. And that's not good for China's sustainable growth in down the road. But it also highlights some of the major challenges for China the investment lag and uh, uh, infrastructure obsessed version of growth. That's what why we say China really needs to rethink about its growth model because China has already invested more than enough in terms of input hard infrastructure. And uh, it's similar to this, the government has its heart dependent. I think every province is still, whenever there's a problem in the economy, the 
one thing we wanted to do is just to go and get more money and invest in the infrastructure. No one is thinking about how and when we do the feedback to get. So I think that's the problem we're trying to get. Thank you. I'm suddenly being told I have less than four minutes. Someone has just hit the clock. So I have one last question to see us. Yes, please. If you can keep it short, then we try to finish it within the four minutes of here. Okay. Yeah, my question is, what about Europe between this U.S.-China trade war? It seems to be that Europe is having a lot of pressure from the U.S. to take U.S. side. What is the view from China? I think this, this, is, this is a very interesting time for China because China needs more friends. And I, I think uh, there's a shared interest among U.S., China, and uh, Europe that we need to put globalization forward rather than backward. But we know there are structural problems of the globalization, the 1% problem that the global elite is benefiting from globalization, but uh, the ordinary people are not really feeling that they are m making progress in the past 20 years, respecting the West. I think that's the problem that needs to be addressed. And there's also a problem of how do you really create a fair playing field. I think one of the key arguments against China is that uh, in terms of intellectual property theft, in terms of market access, in terms of many other things. And China also needs room for uh, you know, improvement in these areas. But I think you don't want to end up being a place where China is playing a European card or Europe, you know, any of these big powers playing against each other. You need to actually find a minimum common ground for globalization, for trade, for investment, for exchange of ideas, for you know the, the flow of uh, technology and things like that. And also, I think Europe and China would also have some common ground in terms of understanding the future. I think one of the key areas that everyone needs to participate and come up with a new rule is how do you deal with the digital economy? How do you deal with the flow of data. I think I talked to one of the colleagues here that in China and the United States, and New India all have this new law of requiring companies to store, store data on shore, right? which is in a way in a global and you know you would expect data to flow freely, but uh, asking all the companies to store data, especially consumption, consumer-related data on shore, and then restrict access to them globally. What what does that mean? For a globalized economy, so right? these are the challenges that uh, I think all all need to participate. And of course, in terms of clean energy, in terms of global warming, there are room for more collaboration. So what we don't want to end up is that you ask Europe to take sides. It's very hard to do that. So I think we have this kind of time. So I'm sorry, uh, we are not clock here, so we will have a discussion of the stage. But uh, I think we've had some very interesting insights. I'm sorry that we couldn't spend more time hearing uh, everyone. But uh, essentially, we've heard that trade is important. It's important to keep trade going. I think Mr. Vinodu has talked about the fact that interdependencies uh, are too many. The point about debt is very important because uh, in many ways, the global economy has spent its way out of trouble over the last uh, uh, 10 years. And I don't think we have much room for that. So there is a lot uh, which is there in terms of the younger demographic and the opportunities that there is. Technology is an opportunity as well as the challenge. So uh, there's a lot out there. There's a big subject. I'm sorry we can't do much justice in 45 minutes, uh, but I must. Uh, I would request you to join me in uh, a round of applause for all the panelists for their contributions to the session. Thank you. Thank you very much.